Ah. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to our Depicting Motion in Sports Comics um, panel. Uh, I'm Warren Bernard. I'm a comics historian, written books, uh, donated things to the Library of Congress, and um, I'm also executive director of Small Press Expo, and it's an honor to be here with everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about um, a very interesting part of the comics world, sports cartoons and sports comics. So I'll let everybody introduce themselves and talk about, you know, the kind of stuff that they do. Go ahead, Jose. I stop? Yeah, you're to okay. my left. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Jose. Um, in my case, um, um, I think the sport is not something uh, principal in my studies, uh, but it's true it's something uh, always is present, no? Um, maybe because uh, I'm from Spain where the sport, the sport have a, a big uh, influence in the everyday life, no? Um, and for me, it's something beautiful because I think the sport is something, um, it's a, another way to... Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, just speak right into it. So okay. It's, for me, it's another way to, to, to show the, 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 the typical things happen in everyday life with the, of the people, no? But for me, something have something more, um, uh, more, more poetical, no? Because for me, the, the sport, um, in a way, uh, is something have a metaphor related with the with the life. It's like it's very easy to understand or, or, or to translate, no? The the, the football match, no? Uh, with the ups and down, no? And and how it finally have a strong relationship with the. With, with the life, you know? And for me, something interesting I like to use always in my stories. So I don't go to say it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Rob. Uh, I'm Rob Allman. I uh, uh, create comics um, about a lot of things, but one thing that I've been focusing on a lot lately is uh, comics about hockey, um, hockey history, mostly uh, true stories or mostly true stories. Uh, about you know some of the characters in the history of the sport in the past, uh, I came across that I just you know you get to draw a lot of ugly hockey players and you know gory fights and stuff like that um, is what you know really drew me to it. But um, it was just a lot of really interesting stuff. Uh, I've always been a fan of uh, comics as journalism and um, just sort of qualifies. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that I don't think a lot of people. Uh, you know, I can, t I can reach comics fans, I can reach anybody who's looking for a story well told. Um, a lot of these stories are just so unbelievable that um, it transcends whether or not sports is something you're interested in. Um, and that's what I like about it. Hi, uh, my name is Ellen Linder, and um, I am currently working on a series of comics called uh, The Cranklets Chronicle. Uh, cranklet is a really old-fashioned term for a female baseball fan. Um, crank would be the male equivalent, <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> um, and um, I do, like Rob, I do a bunch of other kinds of comics as well. I've published a lot of autobiographical comics on medium.com. Um, but Cranklet's Chronicle is an important project to me because um, I grew up as a huge baseball fan. Um, I was the little kid who would always be turning to the the standings in the back of the paper. Yes, I'm that old. We got the paper at home. Um, and I spent um, a long time living in a country where there was no baseball. I lived in the United Kingdom for eight years. And when I came back, I really wanted to kind of reconnect with the sport that I loved so much as a kid. But um, as an adult, <laughs> a lot of it seemed a little bit problematic, um, both in the current day and the present day, but also historically. And so the Cranklets Chronicle is um, a way for me to track the history of women in baseball, which is mostly completely erased and not discussed. Um, but also to talk about the history of America through the lens of baseball, um, because this country has so many issues, and so many of them are pa have a parallel history in baseball. And so this is my attempt to kind of come to terms with all of it, because I really feel like if you're going to be a sports fan, um, it helps to know what you're rooting for. Um, and this is my attempt to kind of get to the heart of that matter. 
Hi, everyone. Um, I'm AJ Dungo, and I wrote a book called In Waves. Um, it chronicles the history of surfing from its inception to modern day, um, but it also parallels my personal history of surfing. And it's interesting to put in the lens of sports because I come from like a background, I'm from Los Angeles, and like it's very much like skateboarding, surfing centric, and if you bring up this point where it's like, you, skateboarding's a sport, surfing's a sport, people will get really mad and maybe punch you or something. It, it, it's very, uh, it's a contentious issue. But, uh, so it's interesting to consider it in that lens, but um, I guess I just illustrate and, and do comics about it because that's what I know and I, it's what I enjoy to do and I'm fascinated by all aspects of it, particularly culturally and its impact on American history and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so that's why I draw comics about sports. Yeah, so uh, you know, it's interesting because of all of the sports that are here, AJ's um, surfing is a solo sport, okay? So you're actually, your sport is not against a person, it's really against the wave. So it's, it's a real different dynamic in terms of trying to represent that. Uh, and everybody else, they're team sports of different kinds. You do basketball and tennis mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. soccer, and Rob does baseball, hockey, all right? And Ellen's uh, baseball um, focus is really more of a historical aspect as opposed to a playing the sport aspect. That's all going to change very soon. Oh. <laughs> What, what are you going to do, just out of curiosity? Oh, the next three issues of my comic are going to be specifically about the history of women playing sports. Oh, um, okay. Well, playing, sorry, I'm, I'm spacing out. I'm sorry, I'm so punchy. I'm <laughs> talking to people all day. Uh, specific, the, I'm also working on a book proposal, which is about soccer, so I'm very confused right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the next three issues of Cranklet's Chronicle are going to be about the history of women playing baseball. Right, right. Rob, I'm, I'm curious to talk to you about, because you, you handle basically the entire gamut of American sports as, as, as a traditional sports cartoonist, okay? Yes. And so, you know, sticking to the, sticking to the topic, um, how do you kind of, I mean, there are different ways of approaching motion. How do you, how do you really um, present things so that people get an idea as to how fast someone is skating or you know, that jump shot or, you know, running around the bases or what have you. How do you approach that? Well, um, a, a, a lot of the stuff I do, it does tend to be, uh, because it's retelling a story, it tends to be less moment to moment in the panels mm -hmm. as, okay. uh, it, well, not moment to moment. It's, 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 it's not, uh, you know, it's it's the, a lot of the action happens between the panels. I guess I should say. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, it's it's not so much. Uh, you know, he lines up for the shot, he skates in, he takes the shot, the shot goes in. It's just sort of you know all that. A lot of that is handled uh, in between. Um, so they're, they're more like photographs of a given instance as opposed to a, a, a filming and trying to show the motion. Yeah, kind okay. of. Um, because uh, you know, and it, it, that, that is definitely something that. Um, I think would be fun to try. Uh, it's it, it's it's a different kind of a different kind of strip than I usually do, and right. I, I am kind of curious, you know, to try that. I do um, where it, your question does pertain to my work. I also I do another strip um, that uh, is called Cartoon Canon. It runs on a Pittsburgh-based uh, website. It's um it's a sports website, sort of like the Athletic or like what you would find for a newspaper. Um, where uh, the creator of the site was a longtime Pittsburgh journalist, and um, you know we cover Steelers games and Pirate games and Penguins games and all that. Um, but he's a comics fan, so I do a weekly strip about some aspect of Pittsburgh sports history. It's yeah. a total outlier, and I don't, you know, I very think most unusual people, these days. yeah, yes. I think most people don't really know what to make of it. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but it's very fun, and you know, the people who like it really like it, so it's cool. Um, but with that, um, again, it's all very, very much based in reality. And so if you're going to depict a moment, mm -hmm. you, I really have to do my homework on that moment. Yeah, sure. Um, right. And the, the, the temptation is always there to just find a photograph of that moment and just sort of, there it is, you know, mm -hmm. draw that. And um, of course, I don't 
like to do that. Um, so uh, it's it, a lot of times what I'll do is, uh, you know, try to ascertain, you know, if there's video, look at the video, maybe kind of page, you know, or go through a couple of stills and, and, and sort of find some interesting layout, put my own spin on it, change the, the, the direction or whatever. I have these little, little action figure looking maquette dudes that sometimes I'll put in the, you know, in the same pose and, you know, move it around to try to get something um, that works well as a, uh, as a drawing. Um, but you have to be real careful about, you know, who was on the ice at this time, who was, who was the catcher for that right, great sure. moment. Yeah. I mean, it's all about, you know, Willie Stargell's amazing home run. Well, it's historical documentation. Right. Yes. Um, yeah, as opposed to just doing comics is the case. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't uh, you know, be as free and easy with just making it up. Right. And if you, you know, if you recount what happened in some game and you have the wrong guy, you know, behind the plate or the wrong guy yeah, in left field. Yeah, someone will pull you out. Somebody's yeah, yeah, going to yeah, bust yeah. you on it. That's, yeah. uh, that's something I found out several times. So it's always a learning process. It's, it's, the, the nice thing is I do go occasionally like way, way, way on back to like, you know, the 19 or the 1887 Pittsburgh Alleghenies or something. No video exists. No, it was barely written about in a newspaper so you can just do whatever you want. Tons of artistic um, license. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. cool. But unfortunately, most of the time it's, you know, yeah, you have a million editors out there ready to come in there and correct you. All right, so, so what we're going to do, um, um, we've got examples of everybody's work, and if we have time, we also have examples of um, what's considered to be the greatest sports cartoonist of the 20th century, Willard Mullen. So we'll see how far we get as to whether or not we can squish everything in. So we're going to start with uh, Ellen. Okay, and so uh, everybody talk, uh, you can go ahead and start here and tell us what you're doing oh, and wow. who this is <laughs> and who that old guy is in the Mets uniform. Mm -hmm. and Who's that old man? Um, well, I, wow, this is, this is such a crazy moment to start with. This is so exciting. Okay, so basically, in addition to being a, a, a big sports nerd, I'm a big New York City history nerd. And I don't know if anyone knows this, but um, basically New York City suffered a cataclysm in the 1950s which is that within a um, three-month period, it lost two of its three baseball teams. Um, so the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers um, were both romanced um, by filthy <laughs> lucre. No, I'm just kidding. Well, yes, actually, that's exactly what happened. Um, and they both moved to the, to the West Coast because at that point, there were basically no baseball teams at all on the West Coast, aside from um, minor league, Pacific Coast League, no major league baseball. And um, the only person who objected to this in a, um, in a position of power was a woman called uh, Joan Whitney Payson, who uh, was, a, was one of the richest women in America. Um, she in inherited the equivalent of a billion dollars when her father died. And, um, and that's the Whitney Museum, correct? She is a yeah. Whitney of the Whitney Museum, yeah. all, all that. And basically, um, she was also a lifelong New York Giants fan. She had grown up going to the New York Giants uh, Stadium at the Polo Grounds as a child. Her mother was a super fan, um, which is something I relate to because my mom is a huge Mets fan. Um, and basically, she was also a, a, a shareholder in the New York Giants. She was, and she happened to be the only person on the New York Giants board who voted against the move to the West Coast. So this is basically the moment when she hears that her beloved team is doing, um, at this point in, in American sports history, um, not many teams had moved around. In the modern era, this is unfortunately a pretty common, um, common occurrence. But in the 1950s, these teams, so sidebar, um, <laughs> the Brooklyn Dodgers, the LA Dodgers have still, to this day, been in LA a shorter period than the Brooklyn Dodgers had played in Brooklyn. Um, and so they had huge roots in the community, huge roots in the city, but people just thought cities were on the way out, especially East Coast cities. New York City was seen as slowly sinking into a cesspool. And, um, you know, the owners of the Giants and the Dodgers were interested in getting some sweet West Coast cash. Um, and so basically, um, she tried to persuade um, the Giants to sell the team to her um, they refused. The owner of the, Dodge, the Giants absolutely just straight up said, there's no way I'm selling the team. Um, and so she um, 
went through a period where she tried to be a good sport about it. You know, she would fly to the West Coast um, to see games. Um, she was one of the few people who probably had the wherewithal to do that. Um, but at a certain point, um, the New York City government decided that it was a, a mark of shame upon the city that they let these two teams leave. And they, the, the mayor started talking about um, starting a new baseball team in New York City. And um, one of the first people who he approached was Joan Whitney Payson. And, and one thing, when I was researching to find a photograph of her doing baseball stuff, so she owned the Mets, and in every single yearbook, they showed the board of directors and the VPs and stuff, and she was always a vice president. I'm not even going to get started. Right, yeah, she was always vice president. <laughs> the so we need wasn't named after her. She um, was, it, the whole thing, is, it reeks of kind of mid-century oh, yes, institutionalized yeah, yeah, yeah. sexism. Yeah. And so a lot of, and th but this is the thing, as a woman who likes sports, you come up against these stories a lot. Right. And, you know, it does you good to get a little mad every once in a while. Yeah. So, so, you know. So let's go ahead and, and now talk about... So, um, these stories are kind of interrelated. Um, I swear someday I'm going to do a story about baseball outside of the, tri the New York City tri-state area. Um, but because I'm doing a series of stories about women in baseball, I really felt like I had to do a story about um, the one woman who is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, the Baseball Hall of Fame, I don't know if anyone, I, don't, I, I mean, I don't know if anyone ever, who here has ever been here, has ever been to the Baseball Hall of Fame. It's a very, um, they try, it's kind of like a place that uh, tries to have a sort of like religious cathedral Reverence. feel. Yes, yeah, yeah. And getting into the Hall of Fame now, even in the post steroid era, is still a big deal. Um, and so I was like, oh, I want to find out more about this woman who has snuck her way in. And this is uh, Ella Manville, right? So the yeah. woman um, who my second issue is about is a woman called Effa Manley. Effa Manley, I'm sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> You're a very busy man, Warren. Do not, do not stress. Um, her name is Effa Manley, and she owned a team in, um, in black baseball in the African-American leagues. Um, and basically, uh, she... Um, when I first started researching, researching her, I thought that this was a pretty straightforward situation. Like, oh, well, this is interesting. I don't know that much about the world of black baseball, um, what we're traditionally known as, and I apologize for this term, the Negro Leagues. Um, I really wanted to learn more. I was super into it. Um, and it turned out her story was a lot more complicated than I thought it was. Um, and her relationship with baseball was incredibly complicated because um, when baseball, after a very long break, um, basically from 1880 until 1947, if you were the least bit, if you were black, if you were a person of color, you could not play in Major League Baseball. And so after a, a prolonged break, a, very, a period of intense white supremacy, which to a great extent continues in the game today, um, the Major Leagues went to black baseball and started to kind of cherry pick talent. And they didn't pay the teams. And so the teams ended up folding because the major leagues had taken their best talent and not compensated them. And Effa Manley goes down the history of baseball as the only owner who managed to get any money out of major league baseball for her players at all. So <laughs> I think she's fascinating. Um, and she's somebody who, even though she's in the Hall of Fame, a lot of baseball fans don't know about. Yeah, so, I, I certainly didn't. I, I heard of something about it, but up until I read your comic, I wasn't aware. Fascinating story. Yeah, um, and you know, you could write, they're, they're, I, these are very short comics. <laughs> um, these people all deserve more, more space and more time in our culture. Um, but for me, this is a, a labor of love and it's a way of educating myself. Yeah, so and, and we also have, I, when you sent um, the slides over, we had two examples of you using motion, and I'm very curious as to the wrestling. Oh, and wow. Um, so now, I, now, of course, there are people who argue whether wrestling is truly a sport or this kind of wrestling. Okay. I feel like this is, and I guess when AJ, <laughs> when it's AJ's turn, we'll talk more. What is sports? What are they? Who are they? What do they do? Um, so I, I have a friend who, unbeknownst to me, at an earlier period in her life, 
um, tried to found a women's wrestling circuit in rural Pennsylvania. And she succeeded in bringing over some of the top talent in Japanese women's wrestling, which has been going on since the 1950s. Um, and so in this panel, basically, one of her, um, the, the most famous Japanese wrestler she ever had wrestle for her, a woman called Sumie Sekai, um, is pummeling someone, destroying them. This looks athletic to me, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> the outcome might be fixed, but it looks pretty athletic. I can't do that. I can barely get out of bed in the morning. Um, and so, yeah, so I wanted to have at least a couple panels where you saw the, the explosive motion of these female wrestlers. Um, and then, that, that, is that Jackie Robinson over on the right? That is Jackie sliding? Robinson. That is Jackie Robinson. And um, I'm like, I, Rob had talked about how he doesn't like drawing from photographs, but this photograph of Jackie Robinson stealing home it's in iconic. the middle of a World Series yeah, is right, such an yeah. iconic image. And it was a very controversial call, too, to his very dying day. Very controversial. Yogi Berra was the catcher, and to his dying day, he said Jackie Robinson was out <laughs> and would not, would not give up on it. It takes a lot of guts to steal home, especially oh, yeah. in a World Series game. World Series, game. yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, it's, it's an incredible, he was an incredible player, an incredible person. Um, and, yeah, I just, the history of baseball in America is really complicated and very distressing. And um, if I can just say one, one sidebar thing about gender, um, it's a deeply gendered sport. And unlike um, the NFL, unlike ice hockey, even though there are women who play ice hockey. Um, there's no reason, it's a non-contact sport, there's not really any reason why women can't play baseball. But because there's no real barrier, there are some people who, are, who really want to just like create fake barriers around it. And from the beginning of the sport, there's been a lot of writing about how it's a manly sport, and also it's a white sport. There's so much white supremacist writing about baseball early on that kind of reifies out through the history. And again, I feel like if you don't dig into this stuff, it's dangerous to just sit in the stands and mindlessly cheer for things. I feel like you, ha as a sports fan, you kind of have to take these things on. Right, yeah, yeah, it, it, is, it is a complex one. Even the Ken Burns documentary didn't really get into those kinds of issues. Well, all right, all right, don't start it's it. very, I could, I, don't get me started. <laughs> all right, so well, let's talk about with Jose, and to say we have a diversity of styles here is an understatement. I love this, okay? So I'd like for you to talk about how you were looking at how you do that. Because okay, so first of all, I yeah. can't draw, so. Yeah, this is a double page I, I make for Fantagraphics. It's a short story. Um, and I, I like it very much because um, it's the, the story of one boy in, in La Mancha. La Mancha is a small region in, in Spain, in a, in a very small uh, town where I grow. So this boy, this boy uh, is me, no? Um, and for me, uh, it's a boy he always dreamed to be like Larry Bird. Well, I, you know, I was, I was just about to say, so on the right-hand page, three rows down, the very first panel, that's Larry Bird. Okay? Yeah, it's Larry you, Bird. I, you know, if you're a basketball fan, you know what his yeah, jump shot looks like. <laughs> that is Larry Bird. Okay? Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because I, I, I always say, and also I, I spoke a lot about um, during these days, you know how how the, the American sport also colonized the <laughs> Spain, no? Because how one boy yeah. in a very small town in Spain, no, want to be like Larry Bird, no? And for me, the beautiful of this is how this boy is um, all boys in the world, no? And how the sport finally colonized the for the bad and for the good, no? The the, the dreams of the of the children, no? Right. So finally, this double page is a bit like this. Yeah, and, and it's very interesting because no, notice the, the motion lines you put um, where you're showing people running with the lines behind them hmm. and then you show the ball arcing through the air, the ball leaving the hands, the ball going through the, yeah. through the net. You've got, you know, you're showing kind of the direction that the motion is going. Yeah, yeah, this, this is something also is related with the, with the technique and with the drawing, no? And I think something also related with what said before Rob um, is like uh, finally the drawing. Uh, I like to understand, it, or I like to think, no, is finally is like a, another game, no? Yeah. So finally, when we are telling a story uh, related with uh, with the sport, no, uh, I like very much how the, the 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 language we use, the technique, no, 
uh, have a strong relationship with the story we want to tell, no? Yeah. So for me, this is something beautiful. And then, uh, then you go to tennis. Yeah, this is uh, another story. This is uh, the final match between Rafa Nadal and Novak Djokovic in the US Open of 2016. Yeah. And uh, the, 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 I think the interesting of this story is uh, there are two stories. You know? it's like the, the, the story is like a, a guy is watching the TV, the final. Uh, so at the same time, he's watching the, the final. No? The is, is he in a wheelchair? Guy yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Uh, he starts to remind his life completely. So finally, there exists a metaphor between the, the, the match, no? the tennis match, with his life, no? with the up and downs of his life. No? And this is the, the, the story. No? Yeah, it, it looks great. And you, you can see uh, all, you know, the backhands and the forehands. You yeah, accented exactly. that with, with all the, the motion lines. Mm. So that's, that's pretty un, unmistakable about what it is that they're doing. And then this one fascinated me. Yeah, this is crazy. This w was from my first graphic novel in 2013. This is... Um, now, on the left, what, what, what is it's that? A, it's a tennis ten match. It is a tennis match, okay. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's, it's oh, it's doubles. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's okay, doubles. It's it. like it's, it's a dream because the, the book was about dreams. And, and in this uh, book or graphic novel, I was... Uh, uh, a very strong uh, reference with the um, with the Persian paintings. How in one illustration or one uh, comic panel, no, you can finally tell uh, a complete narrative story, no. Right. So finally, was this exercise how I can tell a story of the tennis match, no, in in only one page, you know. So yeah, for me it's interesting because finally it's like also the. Um, it's like a, I study architecture, no, and always remind me the the map of the the complete match, no, and you can see uh, from the, the the tennis match start, no, to the end, no. And and what what's interesting is, is is here in this case the only thing that's in motion is the ball. Yeah. That 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 the lines are connecting where the ball went during the ser yeah. during the match, as opposed to the emphasis of everything moving through the air. Yes. So so you used it in a very very different way than you did back here in terms of showing yeah, motion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, also, I love also, that. That's also, amazing. <laughs> also the repetition no, of the, of the uh, characters no, is, is part of the movement. Right, and you can see the guy falling down by the net. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it's, it's great. Now, I've got to ask, what's the guitarist doing up there in the back of the... Yeah, this is <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny. It's like, this is Holling Wolf. Um, um, it's a dream. Uh, so the graphic novel completely is uh, a lot of dreams, no? So in the, the funny of the dreams is like happens things very it's a bit weird, no? It's like a, a howling wolf playing at the same time, a, a guys playing tennis, no? But at the same time they are like a murder, no? It's everything together, no? And and the, the, are these four like soldiers or policemen in the foreground? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so, are they keeping people out of the match, or? Uh, what, what do you mean? Well, so, so what, what are the four armed men, or looks like policemen, doing there? They are celebrating the, the match. It's like, um, um, I think it's, it's hard to, because it's a graphic novel. You're no? right, sure, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, so finally, it's like you have a tennis match, but the, then the, the, the loser of the tennis match finally kills to the, to the other guy, and, finally, and at the same time they celebrate, not only win the match, also they celebrate the, the funeral no? of, the, of the other, no? Okay. So <laughs> it's, it's very, very crazy. <laughs> All right, so uh, AJ, uh, here's totally different, okay? Um, speak about, in particular, the motion of the waves. Um, and, and, you know, how, how you went about basically drawing what's this very dynamic thing that's always in movement. Sure. Um, waves are really easy to draw. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, my book is mainly... Uh, just um, like one person and then just 
a bunch of scraggly lines, so it looks like I did a bunch of work, but I didn't. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's something that, like, I mean, everyone has a very, like, if you just stare at water for a long time, it's, it's almost impossible to, like, think about all the layers and the way the light's hitting the water, and, like, it's hard to just capture that. So, you know, you just start thinking of, at least for me, I, I think about uh, printmakers, you know, like Hokusai or, or even, like, comic artists like Charles Burns or something, and um, it's just, like, concentric lines, and it's, you know, drawing them's very meditative, and, um, yeah, it's just something I enjoy. Um, but in terms of what's going on in this spread, um, so the graphic novel follows um, the lives of me and my partner of eight years, and she's the one who got me into surfing. Um, she had osteosarcoma, which is cancer of the bone. So here you can see her for the first time after you know years and years of chemo and surgeries and and things, she's, we surprised her with a birthday party. And uh, I had always heard that she was a big fan of surfing. And um, that day, I remember she just picked up a board and like paddled out. And I was like, this woman who has like one functioning lung and one leg is gonna go and try and surf. Um, and it was amazing. And that's kind of what's going on there. And then the second half of the book is, uh, the historical aspect I was talking about earlier, where, where there's um, a relationship between two men. Um, neither of them are pictured there, but they, <laughs> this is the part of the book where it's um, documenting the origins of surfing in Hawaii and how um, Hawaiians, ancient Polynesians, were colonized by uh, you know, white America, and, and they, they was, there was also um, these missionaries were trying to stamp out anything that wasn't Christian or, or anything that was other or seemed like ungodly, which surfing fell under that category. You know, there's people with their breasts out or like men that have, you know, they're showing skin. Um, so it became a refuge for them. They, they, they used surfing as a, an escape and, and a protest. And on the left you can see, so these guys are called beach boys. And beach boys were like, um, men that just hung out on the beach all day, and they would take American tourists to go surf, and they'd take them to luau's, and they'd have sex with them if they wanted. Um, they were paid for that. Um, so they're basically like surfing pimps, or prostitutes. Um, the left, if that image is iconic, so like Ellen, Sorry, Rob. We like drawing from <laughs> photos. It's a very iconic photo. If you find this, um, it's it's two Beach Boys helping a woman learn to surf. Um, yeah, so it's it's interesting for me to dig into the, you know, the unseen history of surfing. Uh, we all know Point Break or Johnny Tsunami or whatever, but there's so much more um, that you can find. Yeah, well, and one question I want to ask you, there was a, also a really big difference in the surfboards they used back then as opposed oh, sure. to today, okay? I mean, they, they were like these big, just wads of wood they had put to Can you talk yeah, about sure. what, you know, what they started on? Yeah. Okay. So if this I... This is fascinating. If I was surfing in the 1800s, I wouldn't be, because I'm like a little scrawny guy, and it's like the sport of Hawaiian kings, and these things were like... They called them like Olo boards, and uh, they were huge. They were maybe like 15 feet long, and they're f solid wood. There's no fin. It's just like if someone if someone paddles out with that, and a wave comes, and they fall off of it, and it comes for them, you'll you'll die. Um, it's it's like surfing on one of these doors. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> bigger. Yeah. And right. Thicker. Bigger. <laughs> um, but yeah, eventually, like if you read the book, you'll find out that. Uh, there's a man who comes along and, and starts to revolutionize the way people surf. And, you know, like any change within any sport or community or whatever, um, there's some backlash. But you'll see that it opens doors for, like, scrawny guys like myself to go and surf because eventually they start using, like, styrofoam, which I can lift with one hand. <laughs> Making it a lot easier. Yeah, and accessible. Um, okay, so this is part of the personal narrative. Uh, it's, this is like 
funny that everyone's looking at this now because it's uh, like kind of it's a peek into what a loser I was in high school. <laughs> I would I was like a I was like a wallflower and I would just like bring my skateboard everywhere and just like attend these things but not interact with anyone. Um, so you can see me sitting with all the other wallflowers and um, a group of cool kids come and like one of them grabs my skateboard and you can see on your right uh, a guy comes up and does a three flip. If you guys know what that is, it's like a 360 turn on a skateboard, but also a kick flip, so 360 kick flip. And uh, when I was, you know, we talk about motion, and if you guys know anything about skateboarding, it's in the 90s or the 80s or 70s, it was all film photography, so you would the only thing people would see is like sequential photographs, like no one saw um, video. So I guess this is kind of a reference to that. Um, so you you would be like, say you lived in uh, on the East Coast and then you saw Jay Adams or something uh, in the West Coast skating a backyard pool. You're like, how did he get in the air? You wouldn't know unless you saw a sequence, and that's a sequence. What was the, um, there was a documentary, was it Dogtown and Z-Boys? Yeah, yeah. Did you ever see that one? That was Because you, you, you saw a lot of uh, old footage. Yeah of those guys doing stuff back then, which you didn't see contemporary at the time. Right. Yeah, people are like following people around in bowls with like these giant, you know, dad cams, and like, it's pretty wild, but um, yeah. The sense of motion, you guys, and by the way, these, these guys, what they would do is, is they would go out and find homes that were abandoned or empty for one reason or another, and they would, if there was a little water in the pool, they'd get the water out of the pool and they'd skate the pool. Right. So California is like prone to droughts because you, you were in the desert, essentially. And in the 70s, there's a big drought and no one used their pools anymore. So these uh, ruffians would just drive around on the roofs of their cars, like looking at people's backyards and then just like destroying them. <laughs> and and the, the cool thing is is that they also revolutionized skateboarding at the time. They, sure. They, 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 they brought new motions and new ways of, of doing things that were, I mean, these were leaps that these guys were doing. The cool relationship between surfing and skating is that, like, skateboarding was, you know, it was like a, a scooter. It was like a throwaway sport that, like, you would do if there were no waves. And eventually, like, there are no waves, and then they found a concrete wave. This wave was open all the time. It didn't matter what the conditions were. And you can just um, trespass into someone's home and <laughs> and ride in it, and uh, that's uh, the rest is history. Yeah, and and also some of these, and as it is with the snowboarding today, some of these things you really have to go ahead and slow it down to see what these people are doing sure. in midair. Yeah. All right, and and so your stop motion here does mm -hmm. that right. here on the right, where as opposed to showing motion, you went ahead and just showed the key poses. Right. Yeah. If I had an animator on this, this, these are just like keyframes. They would make it move, but we don't have an animator and you guys are reading this by yourself, so you guys are the animators. And in your mind, you can imagine you put it together. So, you know, you guys kind of complete this piece. Cool. Uh, so let's do uh, Rob. Um, yes. Uh, and by the way, I love this. Oh, okay. thank you. Because I remember uh, uh, Maurice Richard. Right, right. Yeah. Maurice Richard was uh, kind of a revolutionary player when he came along in the 50s, because uh, he could score. Uh, he was very good offensively, but he was also just a tough SOB, and he would knock you out. Um, I read a story, actually, it's probably going to be in the next Hockey Tales, about um, when he was a rookie. Apparently, it was a uh, tradition for the Canadians players to you know, get the rookies, get them up when they're on the train, going uh, to some other city to play a game, hold them down, shave them, neck to nuts and throw their clothes off the train and they tried it with him and he you know just he fought a bunch of guys <laughs> kicked their butts anyway this story uh this is actually a, a more of a a uh an example of the motion um that that we're talking about uh this fight that occurred between um the rocket between richard as a young player and this um veteran guy who was known as a a good fighter a bruiser um, and he uh, went after Richard and, and, and regretted it. Um, but, you know, so with this, I try to, you know, get, get all the punches in there, get the... Uh, I like the, the crack of the knuckles. Yeah, okay. it's just a nice, I, I don't know, it's one of the things that I love about comics to just sort of, uh, you know, visualize this panel that 
can kind of sum up his whole thing. He's cocky. He, you know, he thinks he's got all the answers. He's cracking his knuckles. Let's see what this, you know, this rookie's got. I hear he's so tough. Um, and uh, by the end of it, you can see there in the panel um, on at the bottom of page two, he's just a, he's a, a shell of his former self. And uh, actually, he wasn't even in the league very much, uh, very far after that. So, um, just a really a fun way to take, um, you know, just this one quick little moment uh, in. Well, I like the, the way you broke history. down the, the fight in the, the page on everybody's right to yeah. go down and you you up the score, okay, like you would in right. hockey, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's not it's not it's not tallying goals, but it's tallying punches. Uh, that was a that was a fun that was a fun one to do. Um, it really uh, you know, just all all the little visual tricks that I was able to use with this were it was a lot of fun. And 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 again, uh, you know, uh, as well, as it was with Jose, you're using these lines to accelerate yeah. the motion of what's going on in the panel. Right, right. Um, and I, the color really helps too. I think um, it was nice to be able to, you know, a lot of the, the the work that I do does tend to be in black and white, just simply out of necessity. Um, but. Uh, yeah, the I think the color really helps sell it too. Get those, yeah. you know, those, those fist strikes in stark white against the uh, the the color. The rest of the background being in color. Now I've, I've got to ask: Did you? Act, I mean, is is this um, artistic license, or did he actually, you know, punch him six times and he, he was out? This is exactly how it happened. He punched him. He he tagged him six times, and uh, well, he tagged him a couple of times uh, that first time, and. Uh, Dill decided, you know, he just got he got a lucky shot in, and so he started throwing uh, ethnic epithets his way, and uh, then then it really got serious for him, and that was it. So yeah, it was, uh, apparently, as the legends go, um, yeah. a lot of these are sort of, you know, they yeah. might play a little bit fast and loose with the details. Um, and back then, they didn't they didn't uh, film a lot of hockey. Back exactly. Then. Yeah. Uh, this is one, uh, yeah also one of those nice little uh, instances where, as long as you know what the uniform looked like and have some vague idea of what the player looked like, uh, you can kind of let your artistic license kind of fly a little. Right. Bit. All right. Because it's you know it's a story. Anything auto any, any biography you watch, uh, biograph biographical movie or comic that you read. Uh, a little artistic license will, yeah, sure. will, will help. And and for this, not much was needed because he no. did beat the crap out of the guy. <laughs> so did. the yeah, actual yeah, physical did. number <laughs> of punches didn't matter. Yeah. Maybe it was five. Maybe it was seven. That's great. And, and, and I love this because um, I didn't know about the helicopter Heinz, but here in um, D.C. area, the Baltimore Bulletin's guy, Gus Johnson, right. who also broke back. Yeah. Points, okay. And I love the way you got the shatter because I was watching mm -hmm. a game once when Gus Johnson did shatter the backboard. Oh, yeah. And it was... It's one of those things that uh, just anytime you see it, it just like it, it, I've, I've always found it like fascinating. I'm not the biggest basketball fan in the world, but you show me a backboard break and, and you have my attention. Um, but you know, this is one of those instances where, and you know, you don't you know overestimate my uh, my aversion to drawing from photographs. But you know, to create this, I knew what had happened, and I knew you know what it you know the, the general gist of what it looked like. So. I found a picture of Hentz, you know, or some video of Hentz, what it looked like when he would uh, dunk. I got on Google Images and, you know, uh, looked for breaking glass and, you know, kind of put it all together from there. Uh, I like the guy, the cuckoo guy ducking. Yeah, right? like, oh, yeah, I'm in trouble. So. Yeah, it was really quite something to watch those basketball shatter, because right. those backboards shatter. As a matter of fact, I think that there became a... Um, Rule that you had to have like an extra backboard yeah, thing around you do now. because these guys had shattered them so many times. <laughs> he broke both of them. <laughs> right. All right. Spare tire. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And by the way, that's really hard to do. Okay. You re. I mean, you got to be really strong to do that on these fiberglass things. Yeah. So that's great. Plus, I miss the old ABA basketball. Oh, that was the that was I mean, that's kind of where it all came from. I was like, I got to do something with the ABA to get that red, white, and blue basketball in there because it's just so iconic for that uh, for that league. I was lucky here in the D.C. area. They used to broadcast the Virginia Squire games right. with, with Dr. J. They played. Uh, they were like all over t too, weren't they? they yeah. Were Richmond. They yeah. Right. Right. So yeah, that's why they're called the Virginia Squires because right. they played in a couple of different places. Played all over the state. And I'm sorry, we don't want to go down memory lane. We'd, we'd be here for a couple, couple of years talking about old basketball yeah. players, okay? And, and I love this one, okay? So let's talk about this one. Talk about Doc Ellis. Well, now, this was a story about Doc Ellis. Um, now, a lot of people know about him. He pitched a no-hitter on LSD, on LSD. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the 70s. 
And no, uh, no, no, just think about that, okay? The guy is <laughs> reflect it, upon that. The his, guy is peaking on LSD. In his own words, high as a Georgia pine on LSD. <laughs> And uh, it was well told in the, there's a documentary called No No that's on several streaming services sometimes that shows up. Um, you can always rent it. F super fascinating. But he, but this guy, he, I mean, he had a, he had a, just an attitude. He had an edge to him. Yeah, and right. he, the, the, the pirates were arch rivals with the Reds and he didn't think the Reds were respecting them enough. So he decided, and he talked about it in spring training, uh, but then he actually went and did it. Uh, he just decided he was going to go out and he was going to hit every Reds batter he faced. I really shouldn't laugh. That's so it's, bad. it's unbelievable. Uh, he went up there. He hit. He hit Pete Rose right in the. And uh, Rose, you know, which is a funny part of the story that I didn't get to in the in the in the comic. He he picked up the ball and like underhanded it back to him <laughs> before he went to first. Uh, and then he uh, and then he he hit two more batters. Uh, and uh, then he tried to hit the fourth, and he got out of the way, uh, walked home a run, tried to hit the fifth, and then manager Danny Murtaugh came out, and he's like, I don't think it's your day. And uh, <laughs> he, went, he went back to the dugout, and that was it. But, you know, he, 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 he went out there, and he did what he said he was going to do. He was just that kind of a player. Well, I mean, anyone who's going to drop acid before yeah. a baseball game, okay? <laughs> now, it's, it's different if you're going to drop acid and it wasn't your day to pitch. Right, I right. could almost buy well, that. Well, that, that, that was a little bit of the idea. Like, I don't think that he was quite... I don't think he knew that he was pitching that day. Oh. So right. I don't think it was on purpose, but... Um, but he, still dropping acid when still. you play baseball? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You're going to the ballpark and, oh. you know, yeah, it's... He's a character. All right, so sure. I don't want to interject too much, but yeah, I, my ahead. impression was that the pirates really tried to police Doc Ellis's behavior in general, and I felt like the acid dropping on a day he was supposed to pitch was done like as a fu in a certain way well, to baseball and also to the management. He definitely had you know run-ins with you know there there was a, an incident where he wore curlers uh, in his hair oh, yeah. and um, went out and you know with that and he he you know got you know, got in trouble uh, for that. You know, the Pirates, they, they were the first team to, to, to field an all-black lineup, and there was a very, um, I don't know, there was, there, there, there was, it, it, was that, it was that sort of team, and they, they stood up, you know, for each other and all that, and I think that uh, they did, you know, kind of shake things up just by their makeup and how, and how good they were. Um, you had to take them seriously. Um, so, and, but I, I think that, you know, Doc was definitely one of the ones who, um, you know, anything that he perceived as a slight, uh, he was gonna, you know, he was gonna have an answer for it. Well, didn't uh, they win the 70 or 71 World Series? They won in 71 and they won in 79. 79, right. But right. they were, they were pretty good for yeah. most of that decade. It was yeah. them and the Reds, um, yeah. that faced off a few times in the championship series. All right, so are there any questions from anybody? Three minutes. Okay, if no questions from anybody? Yeah, Ulysses. <laughs> Follow your own rules. I was getting ready to say. No, all right, so I'm curious, though, because, uh, and I wasn't familiar with this story with Doc Ellis at all, but the manager had to come get him? That He didn't get tossed? He did not <laughs> get tossed. No, he didn't get tossed. Uh, again, I, don't, I haven't seen any video of that game. I looked all over for it, uh, and I, 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 did, I don't know if it was televised. I think it's just lost the time. But, yeah, uh, they, they, it got to that point where, you know, yeah, Murtaugh went out and, you know, patted him on the hind end and was like, all right, Look, the, the, not, the, your, not your day. Right, well, also, this is back in the day where you would get, uh, like, Earl Weaver here in Baltimore would go ahead and argue with an umpire. He'd kick dirt at him. He'd yeah. throw, you know. And, you know, eventually he'd get tossed. I mean, today, right. all, all they have to do is come out of the dugout and they're tossed. Right. I prefer the good old days, okay, <laughs> where, yeah. he, you know, you get these guys, you know, the manager would turn the bill of the hat around so he'd get right into the umpire's right. face, okay, and uh, the good old and days. And they would go <laughs> at it and just face to face, jaw to jaw. F nose follow, to nose. follow up question on this Doc Ellis thing. What, was he fined? Um, I don't believe he yeah. was. Yeah. I don't, I, I'd have to look at my notes, but uh, I don't believe he was. I think it was just, uh, you know, just one of those things. The, the good uh, old days. I'm going to have to look, look that one up, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Right, so, so real quick, I, I just want to show these real quick. So to contrast this, um, 
in the United States, uh, there used to be a, a whole genre of good jobs called sports cartooning, and that many of the major newspapers in the United States, New York papers in particular, had sports cartoonists, and Willard Mullen, uh, who worked from uh, the early 1930s till retired in like 1970 or 71, was considered the premier one. I put the pirate one in there just for you. Ah, yes, okay. very nice. And yes, all these are in my collection. <laughs> uh, and what, what Mullen would do, now see what he did here with the pirate. Um, he's throwing around the Brooklyn Dodger to go back to what uh, Ellen was talking about. So this was the symbol of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And um, what's nice is, is he took the motion and then went ahead and put some text right into the motion so that your eye is kind of brought over to what it was that was going on. 20 runs and 30 hits, I think that was over like a three or four game series that just clobbered the, right. uh, the Pirates. Um, well, and it's interesting too that the way that he would depict the Dodgers, he was a bum. Uh, yes. They would call him the, they call him the bums because they could never quite win the World Series. And well, so the story the was he got, in, he got into a taxi cab in New York sometime in the mid to late 1930s. And uh, the guy was from Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, Mullen gets into the cab. And the, uh, uh, the cab driver goes, how did the bums do today? <laughs> and Mullen was like, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, the bums, the Dodgers, OK? And that's what gave him the idea to have, to have the bum. And you can see over here, um, getting back to what Ellen was saying, there were three teams in New York City at the time. You've got the Brooklyn Bum, the Brooklyn Dodgers here, which, by the way, the original name was the Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers. So the origin of the Dodgers was to basically dodge the trolleys on the streets of New York. And so when you read L.A. Dodgers, that actually goes back to, oh, circa World War I in New York when you had to dodge the trolleys. And then uh, on the left is the big New York Yankee, and then the uh, New York Giant there, Willard Mullen always pose the New York Giant as this kind of big, lumbering, sort of slow-witted uh, beast, as the case may be. <laughs> and uh, in terms of motion, I, I got these. Uh, the one on the left, I really like it because the, the punchline is, well, they're, they're talking about the New York Yankees. And um, at that time, the Yankees had tremendous what they call bench strength, so the guys that aren't the normal starters. And the punchline to this is, uh, you know, the wise guys always say the Yankees can beat you with their bench. And I love this motion of the big Yankee just wailing on this poor baseball player and the way he curved the bench, okay, to give this sense that, you know, this poor guy is just getting clobbered under, underneath. And then on the right is um, his boxing, okay, as compared to your uh, fight with uh, Maurice Richard. And one of the things that um, Mullen would do is he would combine both those lines of motion through the air along with specific gestures. And he was really good at putting the both of them together uh, uh, to give a real sense of motion. The second row, that first panel, you can kind of feel the punch. This guy's getting in what they used to call the bread basket. So anyway, real quick, I just wanted to be sure people saw what the cartooning world used to be like. And this gentleman, Willard Mullen, was the most influential cartoonist. There were a number of sports cartoonists in papers all the way out to LA that were deeply influenced by what Mullen was doing. So, and that ends it. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming.